Natural gas is by far the cleanest fossil fuel. Even so, its carbon dioxide content can be as much as 10%. The CO2 must be removed before the gas is marketed. The removal process takes place in these two large containers. Natural gas containing CO2 enters the container on the left at the base. Then a chemical with CO2 absorbing properties is injected into the top. The chemical, loaded with the CO2, drops to the bottom of the tank. After gravity does its work, it's completely removed and stored in the adjoining container. Next, the chemical absorbent and the CO2 are separated. Again, gravity is at work and the heavier chemical sinks. The CO2, now a gas again, rises and is then cooled down. It's then compressed into a liquid. So the gas which would otherwise be released into the atmosphere is now in a form where it can be put back into the ground. This is the CO2 pipeline where it goes into the ocean. It goes through here. It's 153 kilometers long. Goes along the seabed, first through the fjord, then into the ocean, the Barents Sea. And uh, it arrives at the subsea wellhead. 340 meters below the uh, ocean and from there there is a well 2,200 meters into the geology where the CO2 arrives in a sandstone formation filled with salt water and that's where it will be stored safely for thousands and possibly millions of years. Oil company Statoil claims that this year 700,000 tons of CO2 from Snurvit will be stored underground and carbon capture and storage can work at the other extreme. In the Sahara Desert in Algeria, the Insala gas plant, operated by a consortium including BP, has been capturing and storing 1.2 million tonnes of CO2 a year since 2004. So if CCS can work in these natural gas extraction plants, why isn't it applied to all? The simple answer is if there's no ready use for the CO2, it's far cheaper just to let it escape into the atmosphere. And now that's changing thanks to the Kyoto Protocol, which was designed to cut greenhouse gas emissions in the most economic way. Now in countries that have signed up, companies are fined if they produce more than their allowance of CO2. We have this plant, we have this CO2 capture facility. Uh, it is uh, sort of paid by uh, the CO2 tax system because otherwise if you had released the CO2 to the air we would have paid a very very high tax on it. The system places an economic value on a tonne of CO2 that's prevented from entering the atmosphere. These credits can be traded under the Clean Development Mechanism or CDM. European countries and Japan and New Zealand are part of the Kyoto Protocol which have this cap and trade system in place, then what you get is a certain price for CO2. And then it may become profitable to store CO2 underground. And from the work from IPCC, it shows that this price should be, say, above 25 to $30 per ton CO2. If that happens, if this cap and trade system would be in place, then it would be profitable for companies to store CO2 underground. This explains why Statoil has made the investment in capturing and burying, or sequestering, the greenhouse gas. Like all the big European energy companies, it's been set a limit by the government. If it didn't decide to pump it underground, it would have to pay a carbon tax for exceeding its limit. It turns out to be cheaper for the company to install the extraction and internment technology than to pay the fine to government. That's how it works. And that's why some companies complain that being part of Kyoto puts them at a disadvantage with their competitors. According to Professor Flannery, a leading member of the Association of Concerned Scientists, it's the refusal of the other industrialised countries to join Kyoto that is hampering progress with CCS. And one of the great disappointments um, for me has been seeing my own country of Australia and the United States st stay outside the Kyoto Protocol and staying outside it weakens our global resolve, or weakens the, our ability as a species to deal with this issue. After the break, can CCS work for coal, one of the worst polluters?
No one can say for sure when the world will run out of oil and natural gas. But what can be said with absolute certainty is that we won't run out of coal for hundreds of years. If fossil fuel is to provide as much power as it does now, beyond the middle of the century, it'll be coal burning that provides it. 40% of the world's electricity is already produced using coal, and this rises to 75% in China and more than 50% in the United States, according to researchers at the University of North Dakota. In countries such as the United States, with sparsely populated areas, open-cast mining is highly profitable, as here in Beulah in North Dakota. Even though coal here is millions and millions of years old and has been around for a long, long time, it can still be our fuel of the future, because one of the benefits of having it here, it's a long-term resource, it's a, a plentiful resource, an economical resource, and it's uh, a, a, one of the biggest economic inputs into North Dakota's economy. It generates millions of dollars in tax revenue, business revenue, uh, it provides thousands of jobs in the state. In North Dakota, there are seven power plants plus the gasification plant. There's enough resources or enough reserves in North Dakota to fuel these plants for at least the next 800 years. Coal burning emits 35% more carbon dioxide than oil and a whopping 72% more than natural gas.